Welcome to the third annual Food Justice Film Festival sponsored for the Center for Biological Diversity. I'm Jennifer Molidor, Senior Food Campaigner with the Center, and I'm joined by my colleague, Linda Rico. Tonight, our discussion centers on the film, I'm Just a Layman in Pursuit of Justice, Black Farmers Fight Against the USDA. We're joined by the writer-director of the film, Sean Hill, and co-writer, Wayman Hinson. Sean Hill is a filmmaker, photographer in New York City, and currently visiting professor at the University of Nebraska. Dr. Wayman Hinson has been involved with the Black Farmer Movement for decades as a consultant, author, and advocate, and is currently an advisor for the USDA Coalition of Minority Employees. Welcome and thank you both for speaking with us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. We're excited to share this film with our viewers and to talk with you about this very important issue. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So just as a little background, um, and, and feel free to add to this if, if I um, step over anything, but if in 1920, there were nearly 1 million Black farmers in the U.S., and due to historical discrimination, now there are less than 50,000. The film, I'm Just a Layman in Pursuit of Justice, Black Farmers Fight Against the USDA, chronicles the historic injustice toward Black farmers from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Some have called the USDA the last plantation. In the 1990s, 15 farmers won their case against the USDA, and this film tells the story of some of those farmers' experiences with chronic injustice that changed their lives. The Black Farmers Settlement Agreement was a class action lawsuit against the USDA and DOJ, discrimination against Black Americans who applied for farm loans and also for failing to invest this excuse me, investigate this discrimination for decades. A portion of the claims were paid and it took years to do so. So Sean, I've been wanting to get this story um, more attention and do what I can to draw attention to this story. Can you talk about how this film came about and, and how you started working with Wayman um, telling the story? I had gone to oh, what I did an artist fellowship in Georgia and I, darn, I can't even think of the name of it now. And I had reached out to Gary Grant, who was part of the Black Farmers and Agriculturalists Association to see if he could hook me up with farmers in North Carolina, you know, that I could talk to and start photographing as well as himself. So after I did the fellowship, I just drove to North Carolina and spent, it was probably a week or two shooting. For me, it was all about stills. I didn't have video in my head at all because I, I, I was not, I'd never done it. So for me, it was all about the stills and that was it. And I'm trying to think, Wayman will have the story. Mr. Grant had a, an event on his land and they were still, um, I think they were still gathering peanuts. That was dusty and all that. So I'd gone out and I was shooting all that and I came back and that's when I met Wayman was at, at that event. Um, so he was, it was, he asked me if I had thought about doing a film and I'm like, no, I strictly stills and all that. I mean, I started taking video while I was there just to have some, you know, B-roll and all that. But the more I thought about it, and since he had a, a concrete idea, I decided, why not? Let's give it a shot. And here we are. Well, thank goodness for that. <laughs> um, yeah, the, I'm sure the, the photography tells one story, but hearing the family talk about their experience is such an ex such an emotive connection. It, it really was the hardest part for me and, and probably for Wayman as well, because we interviewed each of the farmers for probably three to five hours each. And, you know, to hear their stories about what they had to go through, what their families had to go through, and for some of them, how they still miss farming and, and being on the land because they love the land, but now they can't do it at all. And to watch 
and listen and to see grown men break down in tears because of what they have gone through, that was hard. Admi it, admittedly, and now as a filmmaker, it made the story because you really need to see the emotions of these men and their families. And as hard as it was for us to set through, mm -hmm. it helped to sell the story of their pain and, and suffering that they've gone through for what, 20 plus years? Right. Yeah, it's a, it was a really emotional film. And I, you know, I personally wasn't even prepared for it really, um, but it, it's a wonderfully, you know, put together film and to hear their stories and to hear, you know, why um, it affected them so much. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, what was it like for both of you when you were filming this? I mean, did you expect it to kind of go in that direction or? Um, you know, how, how was that for you? I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I, I knew Mr. Grant's family story and I knew how hard that was, but for me, I guess I wasn't expecting, um, the story of, wait a minute, who's the family in Arkansas? Carpenter, Abraham Carpenter. Yeah, Mr. Carpenter's family, because, you know, they're still doing it and they were they're successful. And to hear and see the pain that he's going through and he was successful, you know, that that threw me for a loop. My, my vantage point uh, in approaching this project and I, that, that's a, a rather crude word for 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 this process and, and, and all is is that I had some sense as to what we were going to hear the phrase that I used back when I began consulting with back farmers in the mid-90s was that when I walked onto the farm and I listened to Mr. Farmer and Mrs. Farmer and talked to their kids and whomever else I, I said then and I still say now I wasn't prepared for what I heard, what I saw, and what I felt. And so when Sean and I went on site to interview the farmers, some of those stories I knew because I'd heard them before. But there's a and there's a familiarity of how stories are captured. And the thing that I really wanted, that I really think um, uh, Sean delivered on was the raw, the rawness of their narratives. Um, and and I, really, and I felt a curious sense of urgency. Uh, I remember when Sean and I met and we began to explore these ideas. For me, there was a sense of urgency then. And there was even a greater sense of urgency as we began to figure out how to get the money together to do it, because these farmers are dying. Uh, and even since the film is incompleted and some other things are going on uh, with regard to the government bills and that kind of thing, farmers are still dying. And every time, uh, every time a farmer dies, it takes the wind out of our sails. We, the group that I hang with, we collectively grieve. And, and it stops us in our tracks. And so while that may be a little bit melodramatic, uh, it really is how many of us feel how we're driven to do the advocacy work that we do because these farmers that we interviewed back then who were a part pre-Pigford and the Pigford legacy farmers, they're dying. Uh, they're dying left and right. They're holding on by a slim thread, hoping for justice. And so we want people who see the film to get a sense of urgency and a sense of we have not ever done right by these people. We must do right by these people because these people are our people. Black farmers are our farmers. They are Americans. They're part of the living and breathing uh, you know, thing that makes us who we are. So yeah, urgency and, and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, you all did a really wonderful job of, you know, bringing, like how you were saying, that rawness and just that like real emotion and really um, just 
letting them tell their story. And um, I really appreciated that because I, I really didn't know a whole lot about that. So, um, you know, it's one of the reasons why we really wanted to show this film um, at the film, the Food Justice Film Festival. Um, one of the things that um, you all did really well in the film was showing their love of farming and their connection to the land. It's very vivid in the film. And um, just a question for both of you, you know, why is access to land and the ability to grow food such an important part of food justice? Mr. Grant had a saying because he was talking about he would be around young kids and, you know, and where in Tillery, North Carolina, where Mr. Grant's from, you know, a, there aren't a lot of youngsters because they don't want to come back because they, they don't see as as something that they want to do or and they don't find it, it, it exciting because, you know, where they are, it's out in the boonies for lack, lack of a better word. And they would say to him about, you know, there's nothing to eat there and all that. You know, there's no McDonald's, there's no Burger King and all that. So he's like, where do you think that food comes from? You know, and there was, there's this huge disconnect between, you know, the fast food stuff and the supermarket stuff. They don't have a, they don't have a clue, you know, that the food from the farm goes to the grocery store that they just assume that uh, the, the fairy godmother <laughs> brings the food to the supermarkets and it's just there and that's where they get it at you know um, young kids need to know especially you know african-american kids that farming is in our blood i mean when the slaves came over from africa quite a few of them were farmers they were farm based most of the stuff that you know the southern landowners got and increased their crops they got it from the slaves you know that they brought from africa so they need to know that we have that connection to the land and it's important to hold and to keep the land i mean i know there are some people in on till in tillery that want to sell their lots and once you sell your land you're that's it you, you don't have anything your family doesn't have anything even let's see there are two farmers oh which wayman who was in louisiana um he still has his land he is not farming oh, it mr. oh mr powell yeah Walter. yeah well he's not farming it um but he's keeping it for his family he's not doing anything with it because now he doesn't have the money to do anything with it you know to, to knock down the trees or whatever but he is keeping the land for his family so so to some degree owning the land is is an identity thing uh i don't think it comes out in, in the film but several of the farmers that we interviewed if we were doing genograms with them or family tree stuff they would be able to trace their their lineage back to days of enslavement and so when they say things like uh, my blood is on the soil or uh, farming is in my DNA, that's what they're really talking about. They're saying that our, my roots go back to the shores of Africa and they were farmers there and I'm a farmer. So that that connection is really real. And then and then agrarians who were enslaved came to understand the way land was managed and owned and the value of it once they went from being enslaved persons to land owning persons because land is power it's a uh, generational wealth uh, if you own a piece of land and you farm that land then that gives you the right to vote uh, at the county committee level uh, who represents you on the county committee and so on and so forth so it's power it's passing wealth on to your children uh, and it's a strong identity sort of a thing. Yeah, so that leads me to ask my next question, which I think many people don't know. Um, in terms of, you mentioned Pickford, the um, legal case and the investigation that showed that 
Uh, as of 2007, only 1.5% of farms were operated by black farmers. The ma market value of black farmers was a fraction of those of white farmers. Uh, black farmers are consistently denied loans, uh, went exclusively to white farmers. And when they did get loans, it's less than half the national loan average. So Wayman, I wanted to ask you about the work that you're doing on the USDA Coalition for Minority Employees. Like, what are you, what are you working on there? What do you do? And are things changing in terms of access to land and, and support for Black farmers? Uh, yes, we're working hard. Are things changing? Uh, not as fast as we would like. The short verse is that there are four of us who are kind of the leaders of the pack, so to speak. Uh, I'm an advisor. There's an attorney. Uh, there's a gentleman who is the former uh, um, director of the Office of Civil Rights. There's a gentleman who worked for years in USDA. And at that point, before he retired, he was the president of the USDA coalition. So I form kind of the fourth member of that. So we work really, really tenaciously with staffers for Warren and Booker and Warnock and um, uh, a, a bunch of others. Our work really goes back to 2019 when Senator Warren put out a brief saying that the Black land loss was primarily defined by the heirs' property issue. So we wrote her a letter, got 70 groups and individuals to sign on to it, says, no, with all respect, Ms. Warren, Senator Warren, it's not this. It's the, the shenanigans of the USDA. So that began some more intentional work. So that work morphed into the Justice for Black Farmers Act. That morphed into when the American Rescue Plan Act was being put into law, being voted on by the Senate, Senator Warnock pulled two pieces out of the Justice for Black Farmers Act and moved them into the uh, American Rescue Plan Act. And, it's the infamous section 1005 that the white farmers across the country, 12, 13 racist frivolous lawsuits says they're guilty of reverse discrimination. We want some of that money. And that really made us mad. And then there's another section called 1006, uh, which is designed for um, uh, goods and services and some debt relief and that kind of thing. And then section 1005, is held up in court. And so the current bill, uh, IRA of 2022, um, Inflation Reduction Act, there had to be some stealthy moves. The senators knew that if they put black farmers in there, if they put socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers in there, that that was going to be a red light or, or a neon sign for those white farmers to come and attack it again. So race-based language is left out. Um, but now so 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 now there are there's there are 2.2 billion in there for um, debt reduction uh, up to 500,000 for those who can show they have been discriminated against. So that has black farmers written all over it without being written all over it. And then there's 3.1 billion for debt relief and X, Y, and Z for at-risk farmers. And we believe that that language has black farmers and other socially disadvantaged farmers all over it. So now what we're doing is we're pushing Vilsack to move faster than he did under the American Rescue Plan Act. Again, you said earlier, uh, Jennifer, that you've been reading my blog. There's one of my posts out there that I wrote a couple of months ago. I'm not sure when, but I accused Vilsack in two blog posts of slow walking the process. It should not take 100 days to design a process to get farmers paid off. And I'll say this very quickly and get off my high horse. But we have in our files, the four of us, in our files, documents that the uh, Farm Service Agency sent to the farmers saying, here is the amount of money that you owe on what type of loans, and here's how far in the arrears you are. Uh, 
And so if, if the FSA can send that kind of document out to black farmers, they just as easily could send out a note saying, you are now released from your indebtedness to these things. And so the money is there. We don't think Vilsack has the heart to do this. We believe that he is going to slow walk the process under the IRA that he did under the American Rescue Plan Act. And more people are gonna die. There's gonna be less, uh, they're gonna lose their farms. There's a, there's a moratorium against foreclosures that's in effect until October. Now, we hope that gets extended, but if that doesn't get extended, some of those at-risk black farmers are gonna be in danger of losing their farms. So the bottom line is that the money is there. The group that I'm affiliated with, the Justice for Black Farmers group and the Coalition of Minority Employees, we're pushing Vilsack, and now this sounds really pretty ostentatious, but I'll say it anyway. One of my jobs is simply to write first drafts. One of my jobs is to help design and implement strategies. So I poured over for about three hours this morning, the first draft to a letter to President Biden to the White House, calling him out for his attention and letting Vilsack get by with this nonsense. And so we'll see how that goes. Those are always reshaped by Lawrence Lucas, the leader of the band, but we're working really hard and uh, we really, really want some positive outcomes on behalf of black farmers. Debts to be uh, canceled and money in the bank so they can get back to farming. That's what we're all about. And Thank you if, you, if you do the numbers that Wayman just mentioned, it comes to maybe five to six billion dollars. The last president gave basically white farmers $12 billion. So for like so for those white farmers to now put this on hold because of discrimination when conversely three or four years ago when they got the money, they didn't say anything. That's that's the problem. Jennifer, there's another blog post out there. I'll just say this and I really will shut up. Uh, I got really mad when these farmers started filing these lawsuits. So with the first six litigants, I did a deep dive into the USDA data. And with the first six litigants, some of whom are right here in Texas, through uh, crop subsidies, through uh, coronavirus relief, and then Trump's failed tax, uh, failed, failed tariff war with China, through those three streams, the first six white litigants had pulled in $523,000. And the counties in which those farms and ranches are located, they had pulled in $1.2 billion. So when they come along and claim reverse discrimination against those stats that you read a moment ago about what black farmers get, that's nothing but a bald face lie. It, it, it's nothing but criminal, what they're perpetrating upon the American people. So if people want to learn more about the Justice for Black Farmers Act, um, it's at the blackfoodjustice.org. And then you can trace it through the American Rescue Act as the women's just talking about into the IRA. And I just saw yesterday, Bill Sack boasting about how all of this money is gonna go to you know underserved farmers and so forth. So it's really helpful for you to talk about that because he just makes claims that don't match up with reality. And just for clarity, he's the secretary of the USDA. Um, where can we find your blog and the Facebook site that I mentioned, where you talk about all these things in detail? How can people read more, follow you, support your work? Uh, they could uh, let justice ring at blogspot, let justice ring at blogspot.com. Or, or just Google my name, it'll it'll get out there to a couple of things. Okay, and we definitely don't want you to shut up. That's the whole reason why we're having you on today. So please share anything that you wanna share. Um, so I wanted to ask a question to both of you. 
Um, what are some of the other challenges and opportunities that are facing Black farmers today that you have come to find out? I mean, the, the biggest challenge, especially for the older ones, is, is, is just to get debt relief. That's, that's the main thing because you can't really survive or even thrive if you're always worried about having to pay off this back loan because you know you're not going to be able to move ahead you're not going to be able to buy new equipment you're not going to be able to buy the feed you need you're not going to be able to buy any more land and conversely for like say young farmers or young people that want to try to farm being able to afford and buy land that's the hard thing because i think now it's big agro is buying up a bunch of farms i know even during the pandemic and then and then during the soybean they all the white farmers that had gone under they basically sold you know big agro bought them and now there's basically sharecropping in a way we're still working their land for somebody else so buying land is going to be the hard thing for any new farmer that that wants to start out and, and there are provisions in the in the IRA of 2022 to help uh, beginning farmers, veteran farmers, and that sort of thing to get into farming. Uh, the question would be, will the process be too onerous for them to really get in and do it? Uh, but you're right, the price of land is going up astronomically when we're competing against big agro. And land and, goes up. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I, I just couldn't say the land goes up precipitously, big time, right. astronomically. What do you think, another question for both of you, um, what's the most important thing that you hope um, folks take away from the film? You know, we're going to have a lot of new uh, viewers watching this and some people hearing about this for the first time. So what, what do you hope that they learn from this and, you know, there are some big takeaways? I think... I know like after Pickford, when, you know, the right was hawking that, you know, these people got $50,000 that shouldn't have gotten the $50,000, but $50,000 for a farmer is, is literally like $5 for everybody else because the equipment costs and everything else. Um, I guess I want them to realize that Black farmers have not gotten, have, they have not gotten justice. And it's not like they aren't making these stories up. And if a white farmer anywhere in the country, if they have ever screwed over a black farmer that's been near them or whatever and helped him lose his land, they know that what these farm what these black farmers have gone through um and that's that's i mean i'm pissed by the fact that these farm white farmers are, are suing and they have held up the money and i talked to wayman and even mr grant i can only imagine what these farmers are actually feeling when the money was that far away and it gets yanked away and like wayman said they are dying you know, so they're not even going to see justice in their lifetime. And like, say, in another year or two or five, if they get complete justice, a lot of them probably won't be around. And unfortunately, a lot of the, their family members might say, I've seen what they went through. I don't want to have to deal with that and would probably just sell the land so they don't have to deal with that headache from the USDA and, and their neighbors. I think, I think your question there, Linda, is a really good one. And I would answer it this way. I think the film does a really good job of describing what institutional racism really looks like. I think it does a real, a painfully, a painfully good job of, of, of drawing out the price that black people, black farmers experience when a racist structure is bigger than them. In the film, I think it's Mr. Carpenter who describes them as Davids 
going up against Goliath. And I thought that metaphor is really spot on. Um, and so if, if we can puncture the belief that our system is better than any other system in the world, if we could puncture that belief and go about the business of making the world a better place, making sure that we elect people into positions of power who can bring about change, then that would be the ideal because racism is with us until the end of times, but it doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to have people suffer the way these people have suffered. And so when they hear and see the stories of what racism and the pinch and the power of racism has done to these people, that hopefully will open up their eyes and say, I don't want to participate in something that grinds people to the bone like that. I want to make the world a better place. I can't affect change at USDA, but I can certainly vote people in who can affect change at USDA, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you know, we hope the same thing. And that's one of the things that we hope people can do um, through this film festival is, you know, learn about these different topics and issues that are, are really happening, you know, in the world every single day. And, um, you know, you both did such an amazing job with the film and really bringing this to light. And I just want to know, you know, what's next for you, um, whether it's together or individually, what are you up to? I'm just trying to get through this first semester again. <laughs> again. I have, I'm about to start, I'm just making contacts now. I'm going to do a, um, a portrait project on African-American faculty and staff and students here at Nebraska to get their thoughts on going to college in a predominantly white state and in a white atmosphere. I wanted that. And I needed to reach, I guess, um, what I want to say. I needed to work outside the box. I initially, the first thing I did when I got here was to try to find a black farmer. And I did find one who actually graduated from the university, reached out on TikTok, and I haven't heard back from him yet. So I haven't totally given up yet. I'm just trying, you know, trying something different for the time being. There are a couple of things that I want to accomplish. One thing is going on now. Uh, there are people within the coalition whenever they speak on radio programs or Zoom or this, that, and the other, like California reparations uh, conferences and that sort of thing, they will actually take the trailer for the film and actually show it as an intro to what they're about to do. And so, you know, radio programs out of DC, out of New York City, uh, out of Georgia tonight, uh, out of California several months ago. So I'd like to see that continue. Uh, the second thing for me personally is that I have a, a rather large database of uh, quantitative and qualitative data so that that academic side of me would, would like to see those things published, that here are the signs and the symptoms and the stories when systemic racism pinches down upon people. So. I have data from a bunch of farmers and their spouses and their kids. So I wanna, I wanna, wanna get that and some other things published, but to keep these stories alive, keep telling them. And to find a distributor for the film, right, yeah, Sean? That, that, that would be nice, yes. That would be really, really good, yeah. So help us with that one. We will try for sure. Um, thank you for both both of you for joining us. Uh, we hope Thanks that more people will, will watch you. the film. Um, audience can catch this panel presentation at foodjusticefilmfestival.com. Sign up to watch the film. I'm just a layman in pursuit of justice, free on the platform from September 15th to 18th. Viewers can learn more about the film at blackfarmersinsearchofjusticefilm.com. Are there any other resources um, or websites or anything else that you'd like to draw attention to today? Uh, not me. 
Wayman? Okay. Well, let us know if there are any, and we'll put them up on the website for sure and, and help people because we'd like people to help support you. So we'll continue on that conversation. And I'd love to keep talking with you about how we can get people active. Right. Thank you so much for talking to us today. And thank you for telling the stories that you do. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Blessings. Thank you.